this is a machine learning meetup. That's why we also have to have a talk about deep learning and image analysis and also about drones and satellites. And all this is uh, going to be combined in one final presentation by Roger Fong, a computer vision scientist from Pictera, a company which has also created the TPFL. And Roger, he started at, the university, at Brown University, where he studied computer science uh, with focus on uh, computer graphics. And then he went uh, to Adobe, and after this uh, he worked in Apple for three years. So the name which was mentioned several times here. And after this he decided uh, machine learning is really, really important. He came to Switzerland to EPFL, where he studied uh, machine learning and computer vision and focused on robotics applications. And this is how he met his uh, uh, supervisor in Pictera and also one of our speakers who was also co-supervisor, Matthew Salzman. And you can also see his lecture on our channel in one of the previous lectures. So, uh, welcome. Thank you, Bob, for the uh, So my name is Roger from Pictera. And today we'll be talking about lessons learned in training object detection models on satellite imagery. So we'll be doing a bit of a 180 from the previous talk and uh, going a lot more in depth to actually deep learning stuff. Uh, so for those of you who do not have that much deep learning experience, there will be pictures at the end, so stay tuned. Uh, so who is Pictera? Well, we are a Swiss startup based in Innovation Park. Uh, there are currently six of us. We were founded in 2016, although the majority, the bottom four of us here, just joined within the last six or seven months. So in terms of our new vision, our new insight, it's a pretty young company. Um, so Pictera was founded on the basis of the intersection of two major revolutions in modern technology. The first of them was described in great detail, just a second ago, and the second of which is Earth observation. So just to give you a bit of context on what that is, this is basically uh, top-down photos or imagery from any manner of aerial platforms, such as drones, uh, aerial survey vehicles, and also satellites. Um, it has a history dating back until the early 1900s, so clearly we've made much progress since then. And today we have a plethora of these various uh, aerial platforms that are generating a huge influx of data. And so what Patera is trying to do is basically to allow users to glean insights from this huge amount of data using machine learning models. Uh, so instead of explaining it too much in detail myself, I'm going to show our promo video. This is work. Nice. Okay. Nope, JK. Every day, millions of images are taken from overhead by an ever-growing number of satellites, various manned aerial observation platforms, and drones. With upcoming technologies such as autonomous solar drones and nanosatellite constellations, this influx will only continue to increase. This massive collection of data is what we call Earth Observation Imagery. Pictera allows you to get the most out of your Earth Observation Imagery by putting artificial intelligence at your fingertips. Using our annotation tools, you can build your own AI models to detect objects in areas of interest across the globe. Pictera combines cutting edge machine learning with your expertise to extract the information that really matters to you. Pictera is not just a powerful tool, it is a community. Share your work with others, get aid from domain experts, and build off of existing models to create customized solutions even faster. As our network grows, so will the amount of labeled data and trained models, allowing users to share and gain new insights from each other's work all around the world. Come join Pictera's community and help take our understanding of the Earth to new heights. Nope, nope, don't do that. Every day, right. Let me just do this. And then, next. Eureka. Uh, it's very painful to try to manage this from over here. What is it doing? Someone could uh, guide me here. I can't really see what I'm doing on the screen. So it's kind of difficult. Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, basically, let's exit the slide and then go back, because it's not leaving the video right now. Uh, can you point, uh, try to point it at 
here. And, uh, all right, you know what? Let's, uh, let's exit out with the X at the top right corner. Am I there yet? Left? <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. Now let's jump to the next slide over here. Oh, that's a pain. OK, and present. Except that it showed up on this screen. Sorry, team. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, we're we click that screen once more, one more time. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the video that you just saw about half an hour ago um, was basically describing this whole concept of allowing users to annotate their whole custom objects and create their own custom models. Uh, so admittedly, we're very much in the development phase for that. And before that, what we want to touch upon is the idea of actually working in the domain of object detection from satellite imagery. So before we get into the more complex topic of custom object annotation and whatnot, we actually want to sort of get an understanding of the problem itself. So what is the problem? Uh, so for those of you who are well-versed in computer vision, you'll know that object detection is a problem of detecting and drawing bounding boxes around objects of interest in your scene and classifying them. So to do this, we need two things. We need two components. We need a model, uh, which we'll be using a convolutional neural network for, because what else is there? And also a data set, which will be XView. Um, so a point I want to make is that a lot of uh, machine learning researchers tend to focus so much on the actual architecture of the model, the different layers you use, all these new fancy inventions. But one major important part of these deep learning models is actually how you handle the data. If you can't handle data properly, you can use the fanciest model you want to, and it'll be entirely useless. So uh, in this talk, we'll be, it'll be sort of a case study format. Uh, basically, we'll be talking about how to use the XView data set to train YOLO v2, uh, the model we decided to use, uh, efficiently, uh, effectively and efficiently. So let's talk a bit about each of these two components. Uh, in brief, YOLO is a model that takes an image, divides it up into a grid, and for each grid cell, it has a certain number of anchors or prior boxes. What the network then does is basically it passes the whole image through and it learns to transform each of these boxes into boxes that ideally wrap around your objects of interest. So in this case, uh, there's a bunch of proposals and it tries to wrap it around the dog, the bike, and the car. Um, there's a bunch of redundant proposals because obviously there's a ton more boxes than there are actual objects in the scene. And so in practice, there's a bunch of uh, confidence thresholding and non-maximum suppression that happens at the very end of the network to reduce it to the final result here. The other nice thing about YOLO Two, which is very important for a uh, user and application, is that's very fast. On a GTX 1080 Ti, which is a very good graphics card admittedly, it runs at around 80 to 90 frames per second. So now let's talk about the data set. Uh, the XView data set uh, was released maybe just about six months ago. Um, so there aren't that many object detection data sets on satellite imagery out there. And this one is actually the largest to date. It has over a million annotations, over almost 1,000 images, it has uh, 0.3 meters per pixel resolution, which actually is the highest resolution you can get with commercially available satellites these days. Um, each image covers a spatial extent of about one square kilometer, 3,200 by 3,200 pixels. It has 60 classes and has a huge class imbalance problem, which I'll go into later. Uh, it has a large object size range and also a very inconsistent density of annotations. So there's some very sparse areas, some very dense areas. And so this is, these are all problems that we'll have to deal with as we're learning how to deal with this data and learning how to apply it to the YOLO model. So what is the most naive approach that we can take? Well, we can just feed our huge, gigantic images into our YOLO model and just see what happens. So what's the problem here? Well, that's a huge image. So if you feed that gigantic image into your GPU, and here we had a GTX 1080 Ti, so that was about 11 gigs of memory. Uh, the issue is that with huge image inputs, you get, use a lot of GPU memory you get a much smaller, and in this case, unequal batch size, and you get much worse performance. Uh, for those of you who are um, machine learning savvy, um, the YOLO architecture uses a lot of batch normalization, and it's been shown that basically if you apply a very small batch size to batch normalization layers, the model performs a lot worse. Uh, the other problem is that it results in very, very slow training with a very small batch size. 
So um, that speaks for itself. So what's our solution? Well, we can take a very simple approach. Let's, instead of sending in the whole image, use t cropped tiles of the image itself. So let's go back to the default size that the YOLO network defines in the actual paper, which is a 416 by 416 size input. You might say, OK, now we're using less data, right? But in fact, the images themselves are very sparse. So we don't actually want need to use all that data. You'll see later in some examples that a lot of the, the space in this data is taken up by crop fields or water, and there's just no object annotations at all in there. So we actually don't need to see all that stuff. Um, in addition, we also get translation augmentation for free. If you think about it, uh, taking a given image and moving it around a bit, shifting it, is the same thing as just sampling randomly throughout your image, right? You're still getting augmentation in that way. So next problem. YOLO is known to be very bad at clusters of ob small clusters of objects. This is because the resolution of your predictions is inherently limited by the resolution of your proposal grid. So uh, in this example, which is a lot blurrier than it was on my laptop, uh, you can see that in each box, this is actually a parking lot uh, filled with cars, each box has maybe two or three cars per box. And imagine if you, say, had only one anchor grid or anchor box per grid cell. You can't even find all the cars anymore, right? Um, so what's the solution here? Well, again, another very simple solution, but one we have to do. How about instead of using a 416 by 416 tile, we just make it smaller. Let's make it a 208 by 208 size tile and then run the network through that. Now the proposal grid looks like this. And now you can see that each grid at least has a one-to-one -one ratio with the number of cars in our parking lot. Ideally, we would actually like an even larger or even better ratio. If you look at briefly see actually, in this image of the YOLO model over here, uh, you can see that things like the dog and the car actually get tons and tons of boxes just assigned to itself. Uh, generally, the more redundant proposals you have, the better, because you have a higher chance of getting the box that you want. OK, so that's great and all. So now we have this 208 by 208 size tile. What's the next problem? All right. So earlier I mentioned that XView has a very large range of object sizes. So the object sizes measured by the diagonal of the bounding box around them ranges from anywhere between 5 pixels to 1,000 pixels. So what happens when you apply a 208 by 208 tile on something like this, a cargo ship? Well, you don't even see the whole ship ever, so you're never going to be able to classify it properly. If you don't manage to find the whole bounding box in your image, how's the network going to learn that's what a ship looks like? So. Shouldn't be a, you'll see a common trend here. There's another very simple solution for this. Let's have more tile sizes. So we have our small tile size here for our, say, a small ship over there. We have a larger tile size to handle the larger boats here. And we have, let's say, a medium tile size, somewhere in between, to handle ships of a more medium size. And so what this means is that we have three different types of inputs now. Um, so a technical detail is that with each of these sizes, we actually scale these inputs up back to the up or down back to the 416 by 416 size. So in, actu in actuality, each of these inputs are at different scales of spatial resolution. So with three different types of inputs, we need to train three different types of network. Uh, so a point I want to make is that in natural imagery with data sets like COCO or VOC, it's expected that you have images at very, very different scales. You can't limit how close someone is with their camera to a dog or a bicycle. So you see all different objects at all different sizes. But here, we know exactly what our original scale of our imagery is. It's always 0.3 meters per pixel. So we can take advantage of that knowledge and predefine these networks because we have knowledge of the scale itself. We don't need to make the network learn that. And generally, uh, the easier the problem is, the easier that the network will actually converge to a good solution. So now that we have three different networks, each being trained on three different tile sizes, how do we actually choose where to sample these tiles from? So there are two problems here that we need to think about. Uh, the first problem is, let's take the small tile extent. So we're going to the second line down there. So what happens if you just sample randomly throughout the image as we said we were going to earlier? So as I said, there's a lot of sparse area inside our XView images. So we sample here, maybe we randomly sample here. We sample again, and we get another empty tile here. 
if the network sees too many empty tiles, what's going to happen is that the network will converge to a solution where it decides to brick absolutely nothing at all. So that's a huge problem. The other problem is that I just said we want to divide, divide our network up into three different networks. Uh, basically, the small tile size would focus on smaller ob objects, the medium tile size would focus on medium-sized objects, and the large tile size would focus on large-sized objects. So we also need a way to make the network uh, learn to train on and focus on these different size objects. So we can handle both of these problems in one solution. Quadtrees. So, uh, Quadtree is an acceleration data structure that is often applied to spatial data. Uh, the idea here is that we just basically want the sampling to focus on areas where there are more objects that we're interested in. So uh, basically here, we just divide the whole image up into quadrants. We count the number of objects in each quadrant. And based on that, we have a probability of sampling our tile from that quadrant. So in this example, half the objects are in that top right quadrant, so that we sample a tile from there. And now we can dig down even farther because maybe that's not, not uh, still too large of a tile. Maybe you'll still stand a ran randomly and find a bunch of empty spaces. So you can go even farther and say, okay, let's divide that tile up into another four. And we see that 50% of those objects inside that tile are in there. So there's a 50% chance that we'll sample from there. Okay, so that solves uh, one of our problems. So now we know how to sample from areas where there are objects. How do, we sample, how do we focus on areas where there are small, medium, or large objects? We define three different quadries. One that is only built upon small object sizes, one on medium object sizes, and one on large object sizes. One final problem, how do we deal with class imbalance? So the XP data set is very tough because there's, say, the least frequent class has only 17 instances, Whereas the most frequent class has over 360,000 instances. So even with any amount of traditional machine learning techniques, we can't really deal with that problem in its entirety, but we can definitely alleviate the situation a bit more. Um, so the nice thing about this quad tree is that we can help this problem out just using the same data structure. So before, we were counting each object as only one count when we were creating the probabilities. Now all we have to do is take the frequency of each of our objects and then convert that into a new count. So very rare objects count for more, more object counts when you're building your quad. So in this sample, you see the blue object here now counts for nine objects, and all the probabilities have changed, and you have a higher chance of focusing on that particular quadrant. Um, the other thing we do is we add in focal loss. I'm not going to get into detail about that. Uh, it's from the Retina Net paper, which is a very recent one. Uh, basically helps with object detection in uh, very clustered scenes where there's high class imbalance. So, Another point I want to mention is that, so that was the whole process that we used, basically, for sampling from our data. A important point I want to mention is that we used no affine data augmentation whatsoever. We didn't do any scaling, any translating, any rotating. And so the reason for that is, well, translating, I just explained, uh, since you're randomly sampling, you get that for free. Scale, you don't have to do anything since we know the scale is fixed. Rotation is an interesting case. Uh, because you are looking at everything from a top-down point of view, that means that the representations of various objects in your scene are also very limited. In natural imagery, you have to see objects at different angles of view, at different rotations. You have to learn a massive amount of representational information about a certain class. Here, you only ever see things from a top-down view, and usually the objects that you're looking at, uh, for example, a car or a building, are ideally not flipped upside down. So, for the most case, uh, this means two things. Uh, one, your network has less to learn about the representation, and two, your data set probably already has all the examples of different rotations that you would ever need to train it on. So in practice, we did do some rotation augmentation tests, and it did absolutely nothing for us. So to summarize all these points, uh, we are using multiple YOLOs trained on multiple tile expense with multiple class frequency weighted quadries and focal loss with no other data augmentation. A uh, little side note, you can also merge features between the three networks, but that's a whole other story. Um, so what are our results? Well, uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about uh, our metrics that we use because they're, well, they're mostly things like MAP and whatnot, and that's going to bore most of us here. Um, and also, since this is a new data set, there aren't that actu that actually that many baselines to, to compare against. They're just our own baselines. But I will show you a bunch of pictures. 
So here are our results on a city area with a bunch of buildings. Seems to work pretty well. Here it's detecting planes, and you can see it's actually very specific to the type of planes. They're both smart, small aircrafts and cargo planes. Here's a construction site with haul trucks and buildings. Shipping containers. A very low resolution image of ships. And finally, this is our Pictera platform. And from here, you can actually see in the blue, all the buildings detected. In the yellow, all the cars detected. And in orange, all the trains detected. Uh, you can actually play with this on our platform. Our beta is open, so please log on to pictera.ch and give it a try and let us know if you have any questions. Questions, please keep your questions short. Spoke too fast for them. Have you been bought by Google? Yet? <laughs> Not yet, no, Are no. Are doing similar things? Do it? Uh, Google, we, we haven't heard of Google. Google Maps. Google Maps. Uh, we haven't heard of them doing anything uh, with actual machine learning processing on the maps uh, in terms of auto detection, but I'm sure they're doing other stuff in terms of. Uh, roads and whatnot and creating uh, new directions and everything. Um, Luca? Um, in the introduction, you mentioned that you work with the, the platform to be able to work with different satellites and drone imagery. Mm -hmm. At that point, the scale will change. So how are you going to deal with that? Uh, so for, very good question. So for now, we're doing something basically where we naively just scale things down. Uh, we are playing with some other techniques using uh, super resolution between different data sets to try to translate uh, between different images of different resolution. Uh, these are things that we're currently working on, so we don't have results to show you. So maybe one last question. Yeah. It's possible to count cars or trains. Is it possible to count batteries on a, on a chemical set or something like that? So that all depends on the data set, uh, of course. So XView has uh, no, no factories whatsoever in the data set. So we can't really cover those right now. Um, however, in the future, we're hoping to build our custom object detector where basically users will be allowed to annotate whatever objects they want, provide only a few annotations, and we'll be able to search for them within all their imagery. Uh, as a quick, uh, actually, we, we have some, some bonus slides here. We have some more pictures for you. Um, this is sort of a demo of, of our custom detector trained on a very simple object. In this case, we're trying to detect solar panels. So the user workflow would look something like user wants to find solar panels, so he does all the annotations. And this is literally all the annotations we trained this on. That's it. And these are our results for detection using whatever model we used. So as you see, it does pretty well. It doesn't quite wrap around everything, but uh, it gets locations pretty well. So ideally, in your case, uh, yeah, we would like users to be able to annotate a few factories, then find the rest in all their images. Do you, do you, on your platform, do users have to provide their own images, or can they pull from, like, do you have a plug-in to Sentinel and to Landsat and to other? Both. Uh, so our original, our first product, our first beta release had only uh, uploads for images, and we've uh, more recently added Sentinel 2, which is definitely something you can play with. Although it's a bit hard to detect objects from Sentinel 2, since the resolution is 10 meters, yeah. we do have some segmentation models on there to play with. So, I'm sorry, but I had to. Thank you very much.